You, as leaders, have the vision, the knowledge, and the experience to help the early care and learning profession pave the way into the future. As leaders, you are truly the profession's greatest asset today and tomorrow. Throughout today and over the next two days, I challenge each of you to stay engaged, energized, and enjoy making those important relationships that will keep you connected and supported in your own leadership journey. Please know that each of you have my personal respect and again, my deepest thanks to all of you that are joining today wherever you are and on the World Wide Web. My great pleasure today to be able to introduce Diane Cashin. Uh, I probably won't do justice, but her accomplishments have really been many. She has a Bachelor's of Honours from York University, ECE Diploma from Seneca College, a Master's from the University of Toronto. Uh, mean, meanwhile, she was an instructor as well at Seneca College, and she co-authored two textbooks, and then she retired from, from there. But true to form, like all people I know in the early childhood sector that retire don't really do that very well, <laughs> I have to say. So she now works part-time at Ryerson University and even more so if you follow Diane on any social media, you know she's all over the country presenting, uh, uh, being as a consultant, doing workshops and keynotes and uh, we're absolutely thrilled that she could be here today with us for our ECBC conference, not only today as a keynote in our pre-leadership conference, but tomorrow she'll be hosting a 360 delegate workshop on work loose parts, like that's no small event in itself. So we know that uh, Diane, she's inspired by the Reggio approach, um, forest and nature schools, the philosophies of Francis and David Hawkins, and um, as I mentioned, she is keen on social media and will bring that aspect. So today was the first time physically I have met Diane, but I feel like I've known you for quite a long time now because not only does she share her great wealth of knowledge, a beautiful documentation, but a lot of personal pieces of her life and things that you've been going through. So thank you so much, Diane, for being here today and really looking forward to this weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. You can hear me okay? Okay, and uh, thank you, Kim. Kim, that was inspiring. And uh, to hear speak of Peter Moss, who is one of my idols, <laughs> and uh, for you to refer to ethics and politics is, and minor and major politics is really inspiring. And I'm so pleased to be here in BC and, and to be so well received by your association and so welcoming. So thank you so much. Um, I just really beyond um, appreciative of this opportunity and really what brought me here is social media and even though I'm from Ontario and we do things a little differently we don't say pedagogical narration we say pedagogical documentation and we may say it but we don't always do it um, <laughs> we are still learning and growing I look to BC as way ahead more progressive more collective more collaborative and so it really is an extreme pleasure to be here and to be part of, of your conference and really looking forward to my workshop tomorrow on loose parts and wow to see uh, to open up my uh, social media feed on and see that Emily posted on the Canadian Child Care Federation page requesting loose parts and then she showed me this morning all of the things that have been collected and after this I am going into loose parts heaven. Um, I am going to start dividing it all up and uh, thank you because I didn't know how I was going to bring it with me on the airplane. So I think it's just really wonderful. So I am here to talk about maximizing our stories, professional learning and collaboration with social media. And I really think it uh, reflects well to what Kim has, was saying about the connection between telling your stories 
and taking a leadership position in early childhood education because what social media does, it gives everybody a voice. So I'm amazed that of all the early childhood educators that I've connected to uh, and with on social media, that they're not all directors or professors or writers or researchers out there. There are early childhood educators who are making a difference through their sharing of social media. So they have stories worth telling. You have stories worth telling. So take, if you haven't started, take today as your inspiration and take my favorite Dr. Seuss book. Um, you are off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Um, it is a huge mountain, the world of social media. And it's not easy to climb, it's not easy to navigate, but you can't, well you have mountains in BC, you can't avoid it. It's a mountain that's there, so embrace it and learn from it. It has truly been an inspiring journey for me. So I'm going to give you a little story. Um, it didn't start, it does start way before 2011, but this is where um, the point from which I became involved in social media. Anybody recognize that picture? Yes? From? Yeah, it's the Loris Malaguzzi International Center. And in 2011, I went on my second study tour to Reggio Emilia, Italy. And I had to work around um, my full-time job. I wasn't really supported um, to go. Uh, there didn't seem to be any interest that I was going. And I had to kind of make some arrangements so that I covered my classes while I was there. And, I loved it. It was amazing. It was the second time I had been there, but it was different the second time than it was the first time, which would have been five years before. And at right there in front of that fence, I was stopped by a colleague at another college in Ontario. And uh, we're not that friendly. I don't know if I even like her, um, but anyways. <laughs> This is only being, it's only in, uh, not, not going to be shown in Ontario. But she said, uh, she said to me, you know, she stopped and started talking to me. And, and, and she said, well, Diane, how are you bringing Reggio home? And they talk a lot about that when you go to Reggio. How are you bringing it home? And I was speechless. And that's very unusual for me. I didn't have anything to say because I knew that going home, I had no place outside of my own classrooms and my own students, which is, I love teaching and I love my students. But outside of that, I knew that there wasn't an interest. At the college I was working at, there wasn't an interest in change and growth. It was a status quo place. So I went back, had no place to go with all the inspiration that I had found, and I looked on the internet for some visual that made, uh, was evocative of my time during this time period, and I really felt isolated. I felt alone. I used to get in my car, drive to the college, get out of my car, go in through a back way so that no one would see me and I wouldn't see anyone, go to my class, teach my class, go out the back way into my car and go home. And it was really awful. And um, I kept 
thinking, somebody's going to ask me, how was your trip? What did you learn? Would you do a workshop for us? Will you tell us about it? Is there some readings you can share? You know, I would have shared Peter Moss. He's written a wonderful, you know, the, the short one, It's Your Choice. It's two pages. It's such a great little article to help people recognize and see the importance of what we can learn from Reggio Emilia. But I was really isolated and alone. But then I had a wonderful group of students and who suggested that I start getting involved in social media. I wasn't on anything but email. I didn't even know what Facebook looked like. And we started talking about it as a means of bringing together the students in our program that I was teaching in. And I was really resistant, um, which a lot of people are. When you learn something new, it's like that disequilibrium, the old information collides with new information. And often it's, it produces tension and you push it away. And I was pushing the students and saying, no, 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 that's for my kids. That's, that's for playing games. That's for being social. That's for posting pictures at a bar or drinking or, you know, that's not for me. And they said, no, Diane, you really need to see it. It's, it's much more than you are giving it credit for. It can do so much. We can set up a Facebook page. I had no clue what that meant. We could set up a Facebook group. I had no clue what that meant. I didn't even know how to set up my own Facebook account. And as I was arguing with the students, there was one student, Jessica, and she had her computer open. And I figured she was playing on Facebook, doing, you know, Candy Crush or something. And I was a little peeved, you know, that she wasn't engaged in the class. And then she just looked at me and she says, you have a Facebook account, we have a Facebook page, and a Facebook group. And I, I, I was speechless again the second time in my life. And um, I, she said, here's your password. And I went home, and I think I stayed up like 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, my family thought, oh, there's something wrong with her. Um, and I just found this world, and, and, and it was so amazing. So I thank Jessica every time I see her in person or on Facebook uh, for really pushing me into that and doing, um, doing me that favor because everything changed. My whole life changed. I got to that point that I realized I needed to get out of that college, of that job. I had been there for 20 years. I was a graduate of the program myself. I developed the degree program, which I had been teaching in for the last, uh, eight, for about eight years. And so it, it was hard. It was, it was something that was so much a part of my life. But it wasn't, it was not joyful. And as I am Reggio inspired, I never lose sight of those words, nothing without joy. And there was nothing joyful beyond my class working there. So I took early retirement, like Emily said. Um, and, and people were surprised when they saw me busy doing things. Oh, we thought you were retired. And I said, really, it was never my intention to retire. It was my intention to quit. <laughs> but I quit in a nice way, right? Like I did it, I, you know, I exited it in a, in a really nice way. And I had a pension. And I thought, I'm just going to try to work at increasing, you know, the work I do and workshops and my, the books I write and my consulting and maybe I'll pick up a couple of courses at another place. And I did right away get um, a couple of courses at uh, Ryerson University, which is such a welcoming place. So everything changed from 2014 to right now. My life changed and it really is because of social media. So, Facebook. How many people here are on Facebook? 
Leave your hand up if you use it for professional reasons. That's great. That's really good. Um, so I hope those of you that don't ha didn't have your hand up, you can see that there are possibilities. So that's my, um, the one with the rocks, that's my own personal Facebook profile. I, I, I don't like my face, so I <laughs> never have it out there. Um, but those rocks were um, given to me at my retirement party from the college, uh, which was amazing. There were about 200 students that came, a few colleagues, <laughs> but mostly students. So it was very validating for me. Um, and uh, from that uh, experience, of, um, I was able to reconnect to many students that I had had over the years and loved. And, uh, and, but from having my own Facebook, I was able to create three Facebook pages. Um, so Technology Rich Inquiry Base, that connects to my blog, also of the same name. And then of uh, my volunteer time, I spend as the chair of the York Region Nature Collaborative. York Region is a region just north of Toronto. It's a pretty big region. And uh, most of my work in childcare has been in York Region. So now I, um, as a volunteer chair, we push the agenda, the movement of more access to nature for children and we do events and workshops and then it's funny because that one is called the Bachelor of Child Development which is what Jessica set up for me and since I retired in June of 2014 uh, my <coughs> boss, <coughs> former boss uh, and probably the biggest reason why I left uh, she never talked to me, ever. She never acknowledged the work that I did. Because I actually took a, a year sabbatical in 2013. And my sabbatical, my research question, was exploring the potential of social media for professional reasons. And she could not fathom that's what I was doing. She kept reaffirming it's for professional reasons. I said, yes, and she had no clue, never acknowledged the work I did. I gave a report. I shared everything. She didn't pay any attention to it. And about a week ago, I get an email from her. And she said, stop using that name. Oh, OK. So it's now resources for early childhood development resources to support early childhood development. And uh, I didn't reply, because that's what she used to do to me. So it's like, I don't have to. You're not my boss anymore. Um, but I still have these, um, these pages. And, uh, and social media, it does require time. And people say, how do you make the time? I used to get up in the morning and have a coffee and read the paper. I don't read the paper anymore. Because when I read the paper, it would be, OK, I like the front section. I'll hear sports. My son can read that. Financial, no one read that. I would read life and entertainment. And I wouldn't read everything else. Now with Facebook, I control my news feed. I do it with Twitter as well. So I don't read the paper in the morning. I read Facebook in the morning, I read Twitter in the morning, and it's the same time, same, uh, I have my coffee, and I'm just there swiping away and, and sharing and favoring and liking. Um, and so it, it is something you have to keep up with. Uh, you can't take like, oh, I'll take a three-month break from Facebook and you're just completely lost. And you realize you have it, you've missed things. There's so many great things that are shared on social media. So one of the things I recommend um, if you already are using Facebook for professional reasons um, and you want to get a little further into it and you haven't done this yet is to join Facebook groups. So that's just a screenshot of my groups that I'm in. And if you uh, send me a friend request, I will accept. 
I don't need to know you. All I check for is if the person is in, has anything to do with early childhood education, they're my friends. And uh, you can look at who, um, what groups that I belong to. And um, these are two of my favorites, the Reggio Emilia Approach Group. And it has 18,000 members, 18,000 members. And uh, it's a great place to see amazing things that people are sharing, documentation, pictures of their classroom environments, articles, websites, blogs. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, but of course, there's the Canadian Child Care Federation Facebook group. And as we are Canadian and we want to support early childhood education, this is a great group to be a part of. And all you do is you send a request to be added to the group. And I don't think I've ever been refused, no matter what. And I think I must be members of, I don't know, a hundred different groups. Nobody's ever refused me. And uh, so don't feel shy about sending that request. You will get into that group. And uh, you will learn. Then, after Facebook, I was a little resistant. But I got into Twitter. And wow, that's been amazing. Um, and uh, you can see, I, I think I'm up about 200 followers since I posted this. Um, when I um, re talk about Twitter, now how many people are on Twitter for professional reasons? Very interesting. OK, so that might be where we need to go. And you've got a hashtag for today. So it's, there's so much you can learn from Twitter, even though it's a little bit harder because it's only 140 characters. You have to abbreviate yourself. Um, but what I look for when I look at other people's uh, Twitter accounts, I look for there being a balance between who you follow and who's following you. Because we're not Justin Bieber. Good thing, right? Um, who's, he's following 10 people and he has 10 million followers. We're not celebrities. So I don't, I don't like to see people making those judgment calls about who they will follow and who they will fo not follow. Follow everybody if they are in early learning or education, or anything you're interested in. You know, if you don't like what they share on your news feed, then you unfollow them. It's, they don't know, they don't pay attention, and it just, it's important because social media is social. You have to share other people's stuff. You have to like other people's stuff. You have to uh, mention people, reply to people. You should be social. Now, there are people that use it, and they call them lurkers. <laughs> but that's fine. You use it any way you want. It's like our personalities. But if you want to maximize the telling of your story, then I say, and I don't know if this is a word, but I say work on your followship. So in that year that I was on sabbatical, that's what I did. I would go and let's say Emily followed me. And I said, oh, there's Emily. She probably is following a bunch of people that I'm not following because she's from BC. So then I would look at who um, Emily's following and who, who, um, who's following Emily. And I would follow them. So I would keep increasing my followership. So I knew that when I had something to say, that there would be somewhere somebody would be listening. So it does take a little bit of work, uh, but that's how you can really maximize. So Twitter chats and hashtags. So I'm going to send out a, uh, a tweet at some point today, and I am going to do, use its hashtag ECEBC2016. So what's really cool about that is you can't be everywhere at this conference, but you can be following 
that hashtag and be at a workshop while to find out what's going on in a workshop while you are at another workshop because people will be tweeting so it's like um, being at a conference virtually it's really cool uh, so Twitter uh, hashtags are great um, anybody on Instagram yeah, Instagram's the, the place for hashtags. It's hashtag this, hashtag that. Uh, it's kind of funny um, sometimes to read people's comments on Instagram. Um, Twitter, you don't have room for all those hashtags. You pick specifically a hashtag that is meaningful. And um, you can then find a hashtag. Um, I often use hashtag Reggio PLC. I actually created that hashtag and it means professional learning community. So every once in a while I'll search the little um, magnifying glass on Twitter and I'll search hashtag Reggio PLC and I'll find everybody all over the world that is using a hashtag that I created which is pretty cool but I see what they're sharing and um, the other day for those of you who are Reggio inspired I found just by searching on Twitter a free resource um, about Loris Malaguzzi a free book <laughs> and it's like wow so I share it I on social media it's social so I don't keep it to myself because I get a really big um, I don't know what to call it I get such um, excitement when I share something and then I find oh I got a notification because somebody has retweeted it somebody has liked it and, and it makes me really feel great because early childhood educators we love children we love and nurture children we need to love and nurture ourselves and each other and we can do that when we share so I don't keep it to myself because I don't want anyone else to see it I share it so that's really um, a great thing to do so the other thing is Twitter chats if you ever want to have a Twitter chat I will volunteer to be your moderator has anybody had a Twitter chat okay that's where we need to go okay Emily let's let's sign one up um, so the Twitter chat they are the most amazing experience for one hour you will not believe how fast that hour goes and it it's really a, all you need is a hashtag so um, I've created one two three four five I have more of these these are called storifies so when you have a Twitter chat or even you can do it after this weekend all you need is a hashtag so you uh, go to storify it's an app and you put in hashtag ECEBC 2016 and it will storify every tweet that used that uh, hashtag so when you do a Twitter chat it storifies every tweet in that hour and so you can it it saves it because Twitter doesn't save tweets for the forever so you can actually save it so I've done it um, um, a couple of these are from my my class uh, and my students love that I said well, okay let's not go to class next week let's stay home and do a Twitter chat is that okay with everyone <laughs> yeah nobody complained about that but they really they learned so much and when they were having this Twitter chat and educators from all over were responding to what they were saying they felt really validated so those are storifies when you have a Twitter chat you need a moderator you need a moderator who is experienced um, and but it's really easy 
Um, the first time I moderated, I didn't have experience. I just jumped right into it. Uh, I just did some uh, Googling about how to uh, moderate a Twitter chat. But I've learned a lot since uh, doing my first one about three years ago. So I use TweetChat. It's a app, and I just put in um, at the beginning of the chat, I put in the hashtag. And so what that does, you don't have to keep putting in the hashtag. It does it for you, and it filters out all of the other um, tweets that you have coming through your news feed about everything else. So it just filters out that, and it stays on topic to whatever anybody is tweeting about using that particular hashtag. Pinterest, OK. Yeah, lots of hands for that. Yeah, you like Pinterest um, for nails and hair? No. no, good because that's when you first get on Pinterest. A lot of hair, nails, recipes. I love using uh, recipes, uh, like having a recipe file or, or folder on Pinterest. But. The, I have 108 boards, I think it shows 104, uh, I would say 95% of them are related to ECE. So Pinterest is like a, a virtual bulletin board and uh, it's you, what you do with it is you curate. So whatever topic you have, so I've got a topic there on Regio Inspiration. So anything that I find on Pinterest I pin it onto my board. But I also might find a really good article on Facebook. And I need to save it because Facebook is not as easy to save. So I just copy the link and I add it. Um, so you can, there's ways of using Pinterest that really uh, aid in professional learning when you start curating it. Or you can just use Pinterest to see what other people are pinning and repin. Um, but Pinterest is great. It's really easy. Um, you find, find it and find your topic of interest and just put it in there. You don't have to go for workshops. You know, sometimes workshops are far away. Sometimes they're too expen expensive. Whatever your professional interest is, you can do self-directed learning. Anybody blog? Yay, yay. <laughs> OK, blogging is, is that's, the, that's the, the hardest, that's the furthest into the world of social media, I think, that you can go. Um, it, it, it's a tough one. And I've been blogging now for, for a number of years. I started blogging with a blogging partner, and we parted ways. She, it, was, it was really hard to do, and she blogs on her own now. Um, but uh, it, it's something, I, I don't get paid to do it. I don't advertise on my blog, um, but I do it as a labor of love. Like, I'll lie in bed sometimes and have this, this idea or this thought, and I just need to do something with it. And I said, OK, I'm going to blog. And I set aside time. I always, I always publish on a weekend because that's when you get most readers. Um, so I'll say, OK, you know, I'm, I'm putting it on my to-do list, no matter what else I have going, that I'm going to blog on Saturday morning. So uh, these are a few of my, my latest blogs. Um, sometimes you can see that one's called Quotes to Provoke Regio Inspired Teaching and Learning. Um, I don't work with children. Uh, I wish I did, and I admire and I am inspired by those that do. I don't have access to lots and lots of pictures of kids, but when you blog, it has to be visual. That's the whole idea. You're going to read an article, you read a book, but, but a blog has got to engage. So when I'm looking at a blog, I want live links. I want to be able to keep my learning going. And I want a visual to draw me in. So I started doing these uh, quote generators. My favorite is called Quotes Cover. And I take a quote, and I generate it. And um, 
That one on uh, the right, it is through others that we develop into ourselves, my all-time favorite quote by Lev Vygotsky. Um, that is Suzanne Axelson, and she is from Sweden. And through social media, she is now my friend. And more than just um, far away friends who meet up on Facebook, um, we actually get to see each other. And this is me in Sweden, and she's touring, uh, taking me on a tour of Swedish playgrounds because they're amazing. And this was like an installation that had colored glass. And she says, okay, you go on that side, and I'll go inside, and we're going to take a picture of each other taking a picture. And so it's my face superimposed on her face. And I thought, okay, so when I generate this quote to use it in a blog, what a cool image to put on the bo uh, at the back of it. So that's what you can do with quote generators. Um, one of the things I do a lot now, because uh, I do loose parts um, workshops a lot, it's very hard to cart loose parts around. Um, so now I've focused on buttons, because buttons are a little bit easier to cart around. So I have um, a post on buttons. So I don't have a lot of pictures of children. There are ethical reasons for that. I need consent. I need to make sure that you know, the families are OK with me having children, but I don't uh, having pictures of children, but I don't even have access to that. So I use other kinds of images, but always have images. So WordPress is the platform that I use. Um, it's hard. It's, it's, it's intuitive, but you've got to work at it. Um, there are a lot easier platforms. Uh, Wix, W-I-X, or Wibbly, W-E-E-B-L-Y. I teach a blogging in, at Ryerson University, and those are the two that I recommend. They're just so easy, and they have a lot of function, and you could do it. What I do in class, I set one up right there in class to show them how easy it is. So I highly recommend blogging as a way to share your story. And you have stories to share. We want to hear your stories. I want to hear your stories. And I can't work with children anymore. Uh, well, I could, but I mean, I, I'm not in a position to work with children anymore. I need your inspiration. That's how I learn through others and through the inspiration of those working with children. So thinking that we all have stories to share. So I'm going to share some stories with you right now. Um, and uh, I chose three stories of early childhood educators using social media. And I asked them these questions. And I sent them a message on Facebook. Um, and I said, you know, would you answer these questions? So um, I'm going to read their stories. I might abbreviate a little bit. And uh, I'm going to start with Karen. Well, Karen's really interesting. So um, I haven't met her yet and been very impressed with how she uses social media. So she sent me a friend request, or I sent her a friend request, and we, were use, we are friends. And I love the things that she's been sharing. And I also see her in Facebook groups and the comments that she made. So I was really curious about her. So instead of putting the story and a lot of words on this page, I created what is called the Wordle. So I took her story and created a Wordle. If you haven't done a Wordle yet, it's a wonderful visual to create, to share on social media. Uh, you own it. It's www.wordle.net. Don't go through Chrome. For some reason, it doesn't work. Um, and it's an analytical tool. So the more often um, Karen says a word, the bigger the word is. So Karen. I work for a children's rehabilitation hospital as a preschool educator. 
Although typically developing children are welcome, most of our little learners have additional support needs. This is my 10th year. I have a BA in English, a diploma as a developmental service worker, and I'm currently working towards my EC diploma slash degree part-time. I work with a great team of educators who share similar philosophies. We believe in the importance of play and of observing and responding to children's interests and wanderings. Wonderings. We do follow an emerging curriculum and I am personally inspired by the educators of Reggio Emilia and of Forest and Nature Schools after attending a couple of Reggio uh, events. I only use Facebook, no Twitter or Instagram. Other educators got me more interested in using social media as they would mention articles, etc. that they had seen and shared. I also love the opportunity to see classroom environments as I strongly believe the environment is the third teacher. I don't know if there was one particular time I felt validated on social media, but when strangers reach out, you know that there are more like-minded educators out there, especially when there is so much out there about early learning that really can be opposite to my own philosophy. For example, crafts versus art, rote academics versus deeper understanding. I don't really have any advice for others. Just like and share what resonates with you. Follow those kindred spirits. Here's Suzanne. I love Suzanne. Suzanne is from Sweden. She has an amazing blog called Interaction Imagination. Suzanne works in a nonprofit private preschool for 40 children from ages 1 to 6, and she is now the director of the preschool, but she also teaches. She has a master's in early childhood education, and her philosophy is also influenced by Reggio. Uh, she works to uh, weave together a curriculum that suits the children, herself, her colleagues, the preschool, and the Swedish curriculum. She believes in listening, risky play, and exploring what is play. She is a co-researcher with the children learning all the time. She is the first, uh, there were four of them, who started the Reggio Emilia approach group. So there were four educators who came together. There are now 18,000. And that was in 2009. Um, she, in 2012, she started blogging, and that was a place to share pedagogical ideas. And she blogs, like I do, maybe every two or three weeks. Like she's blogging like weekly, like twice a week. She's incredible. Um, and it was at this stage she also started to explore Pinterest to collect ideas. I have not used Pinterest for about a year, but I will be grateful for Pinterest for bringing me together with you, Diane. Uh, I think it was one of the times that I actually made a comment on Pinterest. We started chatting there, and then we moved to Facebook. Pinterest I found more limiting from my perspective. Uh, there was a lot of pre-packaged ideas, a bit like prefabricated food instead of home cooking. And that sometimes you have to be cautious about Pinterest. Um, so she started Twitter in 2013, uh, mainly from my urging. And she has participated in a number of Twitter chats. And she has co-moderated with me as well. Um, she says, when people comment on my blog, I feel validated. When my Facebook page, now it's almost 10,000. That seems crazy. So she has her own Facebook page, Interaction Imagination. Um, and um, she says, I feel like I know people, but I don't know everything. So I learned from so many people. And she talks about her relationship with me now that we've met in real time. So twice she came to visit me in Toronto. I went to visit her in Sweden, and she's coming again in August, which is really amazing. Um, and um, she says that she's also made the decision not to advertise on her blog. This is my time. I share it with you. 
and other educators around the world. I hope others are inspired by what I do as I get inspired by others that share online. I think there are few perks in the EC world. Even Sweden, they have a great system, but it's still not perfect. And sharing inspiration between us is therefore important. We are looking to support all children, not be better than others, but the best we can be for the children. And that is always done if we collaborate. A global collaboration means we get the chance to see our own work with fresh eyes, a new perspective, a chance to grow and develop. So that's Suzanne. And here's Tanya. So Tanya is an interesting case because Tanya was one of my very first students in the ECE diploma program in the early 90s. And uh, she went to work at the lab school at uh, the, co the college and then eventually was my student again in the ECE degree program. And I'm very proud of Tanya because, well, I'll tell you the story. She is a registered early childhood educator and a part-time faculty at the college. She works full-time in the toddler room at the lab school and she's been working since 1993. She graduated uh, with a diploma in, in, ECE, in ECE and a Bachelor of Child Development and later she pursued a Master's in Child Studies from Ryerson. I would describe my philosophy of early childhood education as being primarily inspired by the guiding principles of Reggio. More recently, I'm inspired by the movement to connect children to nature and the principles of forest school philosophy, which I see as having many similarities with Reggio. I believe that children learn through hands-on active engagement and through relationship with others, materials, and the environment. I view children as capable, competent, and curious. I'm going to skip over a little bit. It's, it's wonderful, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I eased into social media a few years ago when I was back in school in 2012. I was introduced to it by a faculty in the program that was experimenting with it. In brackets, you, meaning me. I was very reluctant and intimidated, something that I believe was way out of my league in terms of technical knowledge. I started with Facebook and joined a learning community. Later I explored Pinterest and fell in love with the inspiration that I found there. Teaching became, Pinterest became a teaching aid in my classes. Eventually I joined Instagram and Twitter and she uses Flipagram with her students to document learning. You know Flipagram? So it, I saw her post something on Facebook using Flipagram. Ah, oh, you got to use Flipagram. It's, it's really cool. Um, so try it out. Write it down. I consider myself a newbie and still trying to learn more and being, become better at it. I got into social media for a variety of reasons, primarily to be inspired and connect with other like-minded educators. Working in a center tends sometimes to isolate you and social media allows you to grow from a wider context. I would like to start a blog about the work we do at the lab school one day, but she hasn't yet. One of the tremendous rewards of social media for me is connecting with others but also being inspired. So she has done something just in the last little while that was really, I was so proud to see. Um, she shared with uh, others on Facebook groups some of the images of her center and I was really, um, there's, a, uh, there's an element of vulnerability when you put yourself out there but she received such support. She says, I am no expert and I'm still learning but if anything I would offer this advice. Go for it. Share your story. Start small. A photo, a response, a question. There is something special about sharing in your work with others that understand and want to learn. In turn, you learn and grow, and it's motivating and inspiring. I would suggest start a Pinterest board or two, follow other educators on Instagram, or join a Facebook group that has beliefs and values that resonate with you. This will connect you to others and help celebrate the amazing work, dedication, 
and validity of what we do as educators. It's fun, rewarding, and a great learning opportunity. Just go for it. So this is Tanya just going for it. She shared these pictures. This is an inspiring learning environment. I know many of you work in inspiring learning environments. But again, she felt isolated. She felt that she wasn't receiving the validation within her own uh, community. Remember, she works at the college I worked at. So uh, <laughs> celebrating each other is not something that was done. So she got this feedback, this wonderful support, many likes, many wonderful comments. On, um, on Facebook by sharing these wonderful images of the work that they do. Their documentation. So it really is about that last slide saying teachers as researchers. It is an opportunity using social media to tell your story, to do documentation or narration. It's either word is fine, they both mean telling stories. Find your voice in the story. Um, my students, I have trouble with them because they're used to writing essays and not being allowed to say I. I said, no, say I. You need to find your voice in the story. Always consider ethics. If you're telling the story of others, you want to do it in an ethical way. You want to make sure that their voice is heard. And you want to always, always have consents for any faces that you use. But you can also, I know teacher bloggers who uh, share pictures of children but never faces. So consider ethics, and as I mentioned, be social. Like, mention, share. Um, just it, this, this slide is showing that it does connect to teacher-researcher. There is a research methodology called narrative inquiry. So that's inquiry through storytelling. It shows that we, are, as teachers, are researchers. You give your perspective. You uh, give voice to the storyteller, teller, you uh, use social media to learn, and you tell your own learning stories, which is really powerful. Um, this is your brain on story. And uh, I found this on social media, and I went, oh, this is perfect for my session today. Uh, your brain just goes into high gear when you share stories and listen to stories. And we have great traditions of storytelling throughout centuries of the oral storytelling. And we have lost that in our communities. Well, Facebook is a way to bring it back. So I'm going to ask you to think about your story. What's really interesting, I'm a baby boomer. Any other baby boomers in here? Yeah, there's a few of us old ladies and men. Um, but I'm a baby boomer. And what they did is that they asked baby boomers to write their memoirs in six words. What is your story in six words? So this is not just for the boomers in the room. This is for everybody. Think about what is your story in six words. So... I get to use paraphrase Vygotsky. Why not? I love him. I tell my students whenever I bring up Lev Vygotsky, who is a social constructivist, a peer of Piaget, a great influencer in uh, Loris Malaguzzi, I, I tell him, I tell my students that he's my boyfriend. And, uh, you know, he died many years ago, and he's 39, and, you know, my husband's not jealous. But I do say, because I don't want him to be forgotten, because he wasn't validated in his own life, and I didn't learn about, uh, I learned about Piaget, but I didn't learn about Vygotsky when I was going to school, and I don't hear his name enough, so I, I don't want my students to forget. Um, but I am using his words. Through others, I develop into myself. He believed this is how children learn. I believe this is how we learn. 
And I believe that social media is the best platform to make this happen. Um, it doesn't mean that we lose that face to face. I'm so looking forward to seeing Suzanne again. This will be our third summer in the row. I don't know what we're going to do next summer, how we're going to figure that out, but we are connecting again. And that is so powerful when you share with others that are far away, but you actually get the face to face. So think about what is your story in six words. Once you have one, talk about talk amongst yourselves and I'm going to uh, I'm going to tweet take a few minutes All right, anybody want to share? If we need the microphone. Six words. Oh, come on. Yay! I only had five words, and they're not a complete sentence. So I, I just wrote, collector of ideas, manifesting passion. Collector of ideas, manifesting passion. Oh my, there are seven words now. Wow, wow, there you go. Oh, that's Vygotsky's six words. Through others I develop into myself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody else want to share? That's, I love that. Oh, thank you. Okay, mine is challenging myself to find joy always. Did you say jewelry? Joy. <laughs> Joy. Oh, yeah. yeah, did you see my pen? <laughs> no, challenging myself to find joy. Oh, always. okay. I like the jewelry one too. But, uh, <laughs> right. You know, and, and that's six words that tell such amazing stories to me. And I have just learned something about two people I don't know. But I know that I'm your kindred spirit. Uh, both of you on the jewelry part too um, so it, it really is it's, it's a wonderful thing to do to think about your story think about how you can share your story and to leave traces so we don't think enough about leaving traces leaving our legacy of what we do and of course I go to the great Loris Malaguzzi for inspiration on this. Teachers must leave behind an isolated, silent mode of working, which leaves no traces. Instead, they must discover ways to communicate and document the children's evolving experiences at school. They must prepare a steady flow of quality information targeted to parents but appreciated by children and teachers. We must leave traces. Malaguzzi died in the mid-90s. He didn't see social media and what could happen. We can leave our traces through social media. We can leave our legacy through social media. And we don't have to have great positions of power to do it. Social media is a great democratic world. Anybody can lead on social media. So thank you so much. So this is my information, my email, my Twitter, and my, um, my Facebook pages, and my blog. And I hope to share and meet you in the virtual and the real world. Thank you very much. We just want to thank Diane for sharing her face with us, even though she doesn't like to share her face. We're very glad you came face-to-face <laughs> -face with us today to share with us a different way of connecting with people. Thank you.